You're listening to 70s Flashback from BBC Radio Humberside and it's more fan club frenzy for you. Uh, No one can fail to remember great bands from the 70s that glittered and were very glamorous. And this band uh, possibly had the most glittery name of them all. As this week we find out about the history of the glitter band and talk to founding member Jerry Shepherd, who joins us. Good afternoon to you, Jerry. Good afternoon, Steve. So, all that glittered was gold for quite some time for the glitter band and indeed Gary Glitter. Uh, Tell me the history of how the band got together. Was it was the Gary Glitter and then they said, oh, well, we'd better have a glitter band? What's the story? Um, well, it was a bit like that, but um, Gary was actually singing with us before he became Gary Glitter, uh, when he was Paul Raven, and I was playing in a band doing the clubs, and he was singing with us. And um, he then he left and linked up with Mike Leander and did Rock and Roll Part 2, and they needed a band on the sort of fairly promptly... As the, as the record started going up the charts, and we got the call, yeah. and um, we, we we were sort of we got this box of clothes. <laughs> I remember Mike coming down to the rehearsal rooms, and we were we were working out our sort of dance routine for Top of the Pops, and they, this big box of clothes arrived, and it was like a sort of dressing up party, and on it went, and that was that. And uh, the Glitter Band was formed. As easy as that. Yeah. yeah. What about the, the Glitter, you know, the Gary Glitter the, and the Glitter Band sound? It had, a, you know, those sort of strident guitars and what have you. Was that your idea? Was that something already in place as you came to it? Well, that was, that was, that was something that was in place. That was all Mike's idea. I mean, Mike, Mike Leander, who produced and co-wrote all Gary's hits and produced us, um, um, was um, a very successful producer in the 60s if nobody d- hasn't heard of him worked with the string arrangements with the Beatles and the Stones and various people so he'd been around a long time and he just I, I don't know how he came up with it but he just came up with the idea of um, shooting the guitar in a different way and getting that sound together with the saxes and also double tracking the drums which was a strange thing to do at that time and um, that sort of really um, became the glitter sound. With us, would also we used to stand there for sort of about three hours doing the hang, the famous hand claps as well, <laughs> uh, along with the drums. And he used to say, "We just say, oh Mike, I can't do it another. T- We've done it 150 times already." And he just he used to say, "Well, I tell you what to do," he said. Every time you clap, count a pound note. <laughs> a bit of inducement, yeah. a bit of encouragement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, did you treat it as you know, where serious musicians who are you know were just going along for the ride with all the dressing up and the, and the dance routines or whatever? Um, well, it, it, it was just great fun, you know. I mean, um, the, as I say, the band was in place already and had worked with with Gary as Paul Raven for a short for a short while before. Um, so the band was all in place. I mean, then when when it started taking off, because of the, the, the horrendous commitments of being in a successful band, I mean, it's not just all swigging champagne and sitting around doing nothing and being chased by women. I mean, believe it or not, it can be quite gruelling. I mean, there's some intense schedules. I mean, probably not as gruelling as it is today for people like the Spice Girls and those sort of people when they're on their way out. But, I mean, there's some very, very long days and early starts and some of the guys just couldn't cut it i mean it was just too much i mean and they had other commitments and so we were lucky enough to get the you know very early on the people in the band that seemed to gel together quite well um john springgate came in very early on uh, pete phipps tony harvey was already there and we all just got on very well so that made a sort of good chemistry and we all came from the same sort of background of sort of 60s r&b and sort of Brit pop from the 60s so we all liked the same sort of stuff and uh, so luckily we all got on quite well there weren't too many really bad <laughs> punch ups <laughs> <laughs> so when did you know how did the the, gli- the glitter band as a, a separate entity if you like came along because I, I think that was quite unusual wasn't it you know for uh, you know you'd have someone and the band and and then the band comes along and and starts to seal the limelight to a degree well uh, yeah i think i think only only the shadows really succeeded in doing that before um uh, it was quite unusual it was really i think it was a case of us blackmailing our management which was mike leander uh, and um his partner and we were always sort of promised that we'd have a go at doing some you know releasing our own record yeah. and we used to hassle them about it and uh, you know after a couple of years went by you know we actually said right we're going to do our own record you promised us we could and i think they threw us in the studio I mean, I don't know that this is a fact, but I, I just have a suspicion that they threw us in the studio when Mike had a spare afternoon and said, I'll just let them go and do it, and then they'll, then they'll forget about it. Or they won't be able to come up with anything, just let them have a go. So that's what happened. We went in, 
and um, we sort of came up with Angel Face. On the spur of the moment, we had nothing really before we went in. Um, myself and John Russell wrote that on the day. We just went in with nothing and just did it in the afternoon. I remember sitting on the, st- on the floor in Mayfair Studios and d- scribbling the lyrics out. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and we did it, and I went in and in the booth, didn't really have a clue what I was going to do, and just sang it off the top of my head to the backing track that we'd sort of somehow put stitched together. And Mike quite liked it. And they actually released it. And I think to everyone's amazement, it went straight into the top ten. Because, mm. as you say, you know, you, you, you talk about you know Cliff Richard and the Shadows and Gary Glitter and the Glitter Band. Uh, you, usually you need a focal point within a band, and I assume that's the way things are done, isn't it? You know, we, we do have groups, don't we, now? But they tend to be groups of individuals, if you see what I mean, whilst yeah. you had a more corporate sound, if you like, an image. Yeah, I mean, we did we just seem to have this double-pronged sort of dub, um, lead singer thing at Red John and I's voices um in the in the early days at least uh, were, were, were fairly indistinguishable with, from each other and people would find it hard to know who was singing what and it was like having like two front men really and it was yeah it was quite quite good we had the two drummers and it was uh, sort of it all seemed to work work very well mm. so when did you start sort of touring on your own and, and becoming a, you know the glitter band as a separate entity um i suppose that must have been about the end of 74 beginning of 75 I mean, Rock and Roll Part 2 was a hit in 72, so um, we did a couple of years, very quite gruelling schedule, touring around, and then it must have been um, early, um, late 74, early 75 when we, when we started just going out on our own touring. Mm. So, uh, you know, I must ask you, what was the reaction of Gary Glitter at this time to, to your success? You know, more or less stealing the di- limelight, if you like. Yeah, oh, yeah, he wasn't very happy about that. He, mm. threw, he threw his toys out the pram and retired, if you remember. Mm and announced he was getting married to some woman who we'd never seen. Yeah, he didn't like that at all. It was a case of, um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, the record company and the various powers that be wanted us to tour and promote our records and albums, and that sort of conflicted sometimes with things that he wanted to do. Hmm. And it, it, was, it, it, it was a bit awkward. I think that was the main reason he retired the first time, you know, rather than sort of, you know, um, try and sort something out between all of us. Um, so um, that was that. He retired and we went off and did our own thing. Mm. Now bring us up to speed with your other musical interests. I understand there's a Eurovision connection. <laughs> the dreaded Eurovision connection, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, John, John Springgate and myself, um, who, who uh, wrote between us all the, most of the hits for the Glitter Band, um, decided to get together and start writing again. John had been producing for a few years and done a few bits and pieces and had some chart success. Um, with Nicky French, um, who recorded, re-recorded Total Eclipse of the Harp, mm. John produced. Yes, I remember that, yeah. And anyway, so that, that just leads us into the fact that John and I started writing together, and w- we came up with this song called Don't Play That Song Again, and John said, oh, it'd be great for Nicky to do this, let's put it in for Eurovision, and we did that, and it got through, <laughs> got through, and... Um, you sound surprised yourself, actually. I was, I was amazed, actually, because, it, I mean, you know... If you can think of, you know, the amount of writers, I mean, they get they get thousands of entries from wannabe writers. I mean, it's one of those things that can throw up things and make people, and it can also generate quite a bit of money from it as well. Um, so you get thousands of entries, and it's a bit of a bit of a lottery in a way. And you think, well, yeah, you put it in and see what happens, and. You know, you get a little you get a little note from the BBC once every few weeks saying, "Congratulations, you have um, succeeded in making it to the final 24 in the Song for Europe competition." And you go, mm, "That's nice," <laughs> you know. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you get another one saying, "Well, we're very pleased to tell you that you're now in the final eight of the Song for Europe competition." Oh, that's <laughs> and it's going to be voted on radio too, and it just goes dead. It's like torture. And then they have this radio vote, and then it gets through to the final four. They write you another nice little letter until you're going to be on TV. And <laughs> you have to go and get, you know, get your suit out the wardrobe and sort of get a haircut and go down there and go on that. And you sort of think, oh, well, this is, you know, this is OK. And then you win, and you, you get representing Great Britain, and all of a sudden people like... The Prime Minister is sending telegrams and things saying, congratulations, uh, hope yes, you do well representing uh, Great Britain in, in the Eurovision Song Contest. And it's all a bit unreal, you know. Yeah. And that goes on for, it takes your life over for six or seven months. 
Mm. Uh, now the song was called uh, "Don't Play That Song Again," which was <laughs> rather You've interesting. Copy, Steve, surely. <laughs> I'm not sure that we have to be quite honest. Oh, what a shame! <laughs> but uh, anyway, so obviously, you know, the, the song did, did that spur. You know, even though the song, you know, wasn't that well received, should we say, by a European audience, uh, did that spur you into action as regarding any of the writing? Well, yes. I mean, I mean, our sort of remit was to get together and put some time into doing some writing so the whole Eurovision thing really put us off our, 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 our sort of um, pace really mm. because that's what we wanted to do just write some stuff and then like I say that took over seven or eight seven months of our lives doing that and organising that so now we've only just got over that and we took back into sort of some serious writing again but of course we'll be slotting another song into Eurovision this year just in case just to see if it happens again. Just to, yeah, just to see if we can do any better than last year, because I think our, our song came the worst ever in any UK entry, which I take great pride in telling people that. Well, it's, it's a certainly a distinction, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> and as for the Glitter Band itself, I mean, there's a very active interest on the internet about what you're about these days, because, uh, you, well, you're still doing the business, aren't you? We're still out there. Occasionally people like to sort of um, have a bit of glam rock at their do, and, yeah, so we still... We st Pete Phipps and myself keep the band going and we've got a couple of great people in in the band we've got dave glover playing bass and singing and we've got a lovely young lady australian lady called marilyn bear who plays drums violin piano um who's a fantastic musician as well and we go out and we dress up and have a bit of fun and do all the glam rock stuff and you know we do a bit of glitter band stuff and some other hits from other people and um it's great Mm. Do you find that the audiences who, who see you, are they uh, all ages? Are they teenagers today? Who they're, are they? pretty, they're pretty much all ages, really. I mean, we also seem to be doing an awful lot more work in Europe. Um, in Germany especially, they seem, to, they seem to love all the sort of 60s and 70s stuff. Um, so we seem to be doing sort of ever increasing more work over there, which is quite nice. Uh, um, not so much over here. Mm. Well, it sounds as if you're busy enough. Uh, I'll not keep you any longer. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and uh, wish you all a success for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That's Jerry Shepherd from the Glitterbird.